many persons. Yes, it is. Now, do you think that this is a subject that demands very keen attention? Yes, it is. Because unfortunately, the devastation that we see in the world today, the crime and the violence, the war, the bloodshed, all of the sexual immorality, it has its roots in the home. And if the home was properly corrected, it would actually solve the social ills of society. Does that make sense? So for this evening, I'm praying that by the grace of God, that which is communicated will leave an indelible impression upon our, our minds. And in light of that, I'm going to kneel and have a word of prayer that God's spirit may be with us. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege of being a mouthpiece and a spokesperson for you. Father, you know that I am unworthy to be in this position, Lord, but again, as you tell us in the book of Romans, that you have ordained that many souls be one to the truth by the foolishness of preaching. Dear Father, I pray that you be with all of my friends and family that are here. As a church family, Lord, I pray that you would help us to really understand what you are going to communicate this evening. And I pray that you would even be with those who are going to watch this telecast in the future. Lord, that none of what is communicated will lose its efficacy uh, through this medium of translation. And so I just pray in a very special way that your Holy Spirit may be with us, enlighten our understanding, especially upon this subject, Heavenly Father Satan has inculcated so many false principles that are leading us to destruction. But as you communicate these right principles, I pray that you will give us hearts to receive them. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in light of that, let us open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. We're going to read our opening text in the book of Romans. We're going to read our opening text in the book of Romans. We're going to read our opening text in the book of Romans. Now we're going to read in Romans chapter 15, starting in verse four. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse four. The Bible says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, now when, this, when it says aforetime, what does this word mean? Okay, so that which was written in the past were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Might have hope. Now to get some more context, let's turn to 1 Corinthians. Let's get some more definite context because there is a particular history that the Bible especially is seeking to highlight. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read in verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 11. Now in context, what group of people is the Bible speaking of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Yes, the children of Israel. Now do the children of Israel, do they have a direct connection with those of us living here at the end of time? Yes. It says, now all these things happen unto them, the children of Israel, for in samples or examples, and they are written for our what? They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now notice what it says in verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he what? He standeth, take heed lest he what? Now, is this talking about just falling or, or, and tripping over a brick? No, this is talking about falling into sin. So what God is saying is that we have to pay keen attention to the experience of ancient Israel, because if we do not, we are in serious danger of practicing those same mistakes. Does that make sense? All right. Now, again, now, who is this an artist's rendition of? This is an artist's rendition of Moses. Now, was Moses a, 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 a man of God? Yes, he was. Notice this again from volume three of the testimonies. Now, does anybody know why we are repeating uh, these same things that we went over yesterday? 
Does anybody know? Why, why are we repeating this again? Because repetition deepens the what? One of the great reasons why the children of Israel kept falling into apostasy because it was difficult for them to remember the teachings of God. This is why God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? To keep it holy. In order for something to literally become a part of our character, we have to go over it again and again and again. And sometimes I, I, lit I shudder when I hear people say such things as I've heard that before. You know, sometimes when certain truths are being preached from the pulpit, some people will say, well, I've heard those truths before. What is being communicated by the, by the minister has no uh, uh, effect upon me because I've heard these things for the past 10 years. You know, it's very sad. That was the same condition that the antediluvians were in before the flood. Noah was preaching the same exact message of repentance and get on the boat for 120 years. Now, how many people got on the boat? Only eight. Unfortunately, they did not take serious the message that God was repeating again and again and again. This says the Apostle Paul plainly states that the experience of the Israelites in their travels has been recorded for the benefit of those living in what age of the world? In this age of the world. It says those upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says, we do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, but what? But greater. There will be temptations to jealousies and murmurings, and there will be outspoken rebellion, as are recorded of ancient Israel. But shall the voice of reproof be hushed because of this? All right. Now, what is this right here? This is a symbol of a broken home. Now, are the vast majority of homes today, especially in the Western world, are they broken? Yes, they're severely broken. And even the homes that seem to be intact, are they happy? No, they're not happy. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. We're going to see what the divine watcher records as it pertains to the condition of the vast majority of homes. We're going to read in Proverbs chapter 15, and we're going to read in verse 17. Proverbs chapter 15 in verse 17. You know, the book of Proverbs may be my favorite book of the Bible, and the reason being is because the book of Proverbs, it's so practical to everyday life. It's so practical. In verse 17, it says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is. Now, can you really get full off of herbs alone? No, you can't. Now, can you get a full meal just eating parsley? Can you get a full meal just eating basil? No, you can't. But notice what the verse goes on to say. It says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. So the Bible is saying that it's better to have a home that is poor but has love than to be in a home with a large feast and there is hatred and strife. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. Let's turn to chapter 17 and verse 1. Chapter 17 in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 17 in verse 1. It says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. So in light of these texts, do you think it is a serious thing or a not serious thing to have love in the home? It's a very serious thing. Because without the special ingredient of love, every home will be destroyed. Now, there are many famous actors that are in the world today. We can think of Tom Cruise and all of these other men and women now, is Tom Cruise still uh, married to Nicole Kidman? No, he's not. Is he still married to, um, uh, what's her name? Katie Holmes. Is he still married to her? No, he's not. So even though these men and women 
literally have hundreds of millions of dollars, are they happy? No, they're not. Everybody see this? Now, who do you think is wearing the pants in this relationship? Who do you think is wearing the pants, really, in this relationship? Who seems to have all the attitude? The woman. Now, do you think that the vast majority of homes, especially in Western society, do you think that the order has been reversed? Now, we're not going to get into all of the details, but one of the, the most important ingredients in having a successful home is understanding something called gender roles. Now, are gender roles very important in a home? It's, it's intrinsically important. Now, who is the head of the household? The husband. The husband. And unfortunately, this is a statement that triggers a lot of persons but is this a controversial point? Now, should it be a controversial point? No, it shouldn't be. Now, what was to be the position of the wife? What was to be the position of the wife? She was to be a help me. Now, does a help me, does that mean that she is being degraded? You see, because when a woman understands the power that she has as a help me, she will love to function in that position. But unfortunately, unfortunately, like a lot of modern restless Eves, they are not satisfied with being in their position. All right, this says, why women file for divorce more than men? Now, we're not going to go through all the details. Now, where is this taken from? Now, does the world understand that the conditions of the homes of the world are th that they're in trouble? Does the world see this? But does the world have the solution to the problems of the home? No, they don't. This says the decision to end a marriage is often difficult and couples may spend months or even years soul searching before calling it quits. Now, this is actually not even the case uh, a lot of times in, in today's society. People will get married and get divorced six months later. In the US specifically, where no fault divorce is, is legal in all 50 states, some estimates put the figure at what? 70%. In the UK, it says statistics showed women petitioned 62% of divorces in England and Wales. We're, we're going to skip past uh, this. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Now, does anybody, can anybody discern what this is? Can anybody discern what that is? Does this woman, does she look happy? Does she look sad? She looks very, very sad. Very, very sad. Percentage of births to unmarried women. Now, do you think children being born out of wedlock is a serious problem in today's society? Unfortunately, this lifestyle has been made in vogue today. It is even considered very fashionable to have children outside of wedlock. And it's amazing because even the world acknowledges the fact that children have a better chance at life when they have a stable mother and father. This says, besides which country you are born in, in my view, the most important factor, now remember, this is taken from the National Review. Now, is this a Christian outlet? No, it's not. This says, in my view, is the most important factor by far in explaining disparities in all manner of life outcomes. Poverty, unemployment, crime, education, you name it. Of the vast majority of people that are currently located in prisons in the United States, how many of them do you think were born to single mothers? Do you think it's a large percentage? Yes. Now, in light of all this devastation, does God have a solution to this issue? You know, there's a book called The Ministry of Healing. Who here has ever heard of The Ministry of Healing? Now, who here has actually read and studied the book, The Ministry of Healing? Now, brothers and sisters, there are two books that if you haven't read, I would strongly encourage you to make priori uh, priority today. Those two books are The Great Controversy and The Ministry of Healing. 
if you have not gone through those two volumes, you need to go through those books now. It says, late last year, the final data for 2018 were published here, and here's what we learned. For all racial and ethnic groups combined, 39.6% of births were out of wedlock. Now, so this is saying that of all of the births in the United States, 40% were born out of wedlock. Again, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? That's a very bad thing. Notice. And there was always a tremendous range among groups. It says for blacks, the number is 70%. Is that serious? That's very serious. Notice. It says for American Indians, 68%. It says for uh, Native Hawaiians, 50, for Hispanics, 51, for whites, 28%, for Asian Americans, and uh, paltry, 11.7%. All right, we're going through these points. This says out of wedlock births rise worldwide. It says at one extreme are some 25 countries, including China and India, and it, and it talks about all of these uh, nations. It says, now this is amazing. In striking contrast, the proportions of births outside marriage is another 25 countries, mostly in Latin America, including Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Me Mexico, and Colombia, are estimated at more than 60%. Is that serious? Is that a vast, large percentage? All right, we're getting to a point. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of another one of the factors that Satan is using to destroy the home. Now, do you think that this man is watching a presentation from Amazing Facts on Revelation 13? Do you think that this man is watching a presentation on the fact that Christ is his righteousness? What do you think that this man is watching on this television screen? He's watching pornography. Now, do you think that pornography is destroying our homes? And again, it, it, I don't know if we put up the statistic, but I believe it's over 60% of men in the church are addicted to pornography. And this is men even preaching from the pulpit, serving as elders and deacons, literally addicted to pornography. And some will even go so far as to say that they're not committing adultery. This is deception. This says pornography statistics. Now, this is taken from a very good outlet called Covenant Eyes. Has anybody ever heard of Covenant Eyes? This is actually a ministry that has been developed in order to help people overcome the addiction of pornography. These, these are Christians that started this particular ministry. It says, notice these statistics. In 2006, estimated revenues for a sex-related entertainment business were just under 13 billion dollars. It is amazing when you look up the statistics how much money the porn industry made during the uh, during the COVID lockdowns. I mean they made so much money. It says uh, over 28,000 are watching pornography every second. It says three over three thousand dollars is spent on pornography every second on the internet. Now, in light of this, do you think that we have an, an, an intrinsic responsibility, especially as parents, to teach our young people about the principles of proper sexuality? Because again, are the vast majority of us as parents teaching our children about human sexuality? We're not. And when we are not teaching our children, who is teaching our children about their sexuality? Disney and Netflix and Hulu, and, 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 the, and the doctrines that they are receiving when they go to school. Now, you know, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Let's turn in our Bibles to the, books of, to the book of Exodus. Now, this is a question, Exodus chapter 20. Are we, as God's people, do we profess to keep the commandments of God? Yes, as Christians. Now, Exodus chapter 20 and we are going to read in verse 14, Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, in verse 14. It says, thou shalt not commit what? Now, what is adultery? What is adultery? What is adultery? 
So sexual relations, when you are outside of marriage specifically with those who are uh, of, of the marriage relation, does that make sense? So if we're going to teach our children about the commandments of God, when it talks about not committing adultery, do you think that we have to explain to them the principles of sexuality? Yes. It says 79% of porn performers have used marijuana and 50% have used ecstasy. So it, go, it talks about all this. Now notice, this is porn stats in the church. One in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors use porn on a regular basis. 43% of senior pastors and youth pastors say they have struggled with pornography in the past. And it says, notice that, that says 64% of Christian men watch pornography every month. Do you think it's really just once a month? It's probably at least once every few days. It says only 7% only of pastors report their church has a ministry program for those struggling with pornography. Do you think that we need to provide an, a, a, a place where people can receive healing from these addictions? Now, this is a question. Are these addictions, is, is, is overcoming this just merely explaining to them principles of information? Is just giving people information going to give them victory over this? You see, because the reality is, is that when people are addicted to these mediums, they're under the power of a demon. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of James. Because God really wants us to understand the reality of the fact that when we are enslaved to any sin, it may not be pornography, it may be drinking, it may be lying, it may be stealing, whatever the case may be. When we are being dominated by these sins, we are under the control of demons. James chapter 5, James chapter 5, we're, go we're going to read in verse 14. James chapter 5, and we're going to read in verse 14. Notice what the Bible says in James chapter 5. It says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the what? It says, and the prayer of, the f of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven what? Now, why is the Bible instructing for the elders of the church to be called when somebody is sick? What is the purpose of calling the elders? What is the purpose of calling the elders? What is the purpose? Is God just saying this for any happenstance reason, or is there a specific purpose why we need to call the elders when we're being dominated by these sins? Okay, so they're called to live a righteous life, and because of their connection with God, by the grace of God, they can bring that person to the throne of grace. Does that make sense? So when we're being dominated by these things, we need to have spiritual people around us who can pray and intercede on our behalf. Does that make sense? Because we're told in the spirit of prophecy that the work of medical missionary work is largely a spiritual work. It's not largely about fomentations and cooking classes. It's largely a spiritual work. All right. This is taken from volume two of the testimonies. It says, a terrible picture of the condition of the world has been presented before me. Immorality abounds where? You know, and what's so amazing about this statement is that this statement was written over 100 years ago. And many of us will look back on this time around the turn of the 20th century, and, and we talk of that period as if it was completely Puritan, as if it was one of the greatest epochs in the history of civilization, that there was purity abounding, but the prophet, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was saying that even at that time, that it was filled with licentiousness. Licentiousness is the special sin of the age. Never did vice lift its deformed head with such boldness as now. You know, if we really understood what sexual immorality is, 
we would literally cringe when we see it. When we would see that which is immoral put before our eyes, God wants it where our very nature would recoil from even beholding it. It says, many men and women who profess the religion of Christ are guilty. Even some who profess to be looking for his appearing, notice what the prophet says. Looking for his appearing are no, mere, are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself. Can you imagine? They are not cleansing themselves from all pollution. They have so long served their lust that it is natural for their thoughts to be impure and their imaginations corrupt. Do you think that we need deliverance from these mechanisms? Yes, we do, brothers and sisters. Notice this. Now, when you see this picture, what comes into your mind? Do they look sad? Do they look, look like they're being dominated by Satan? This is a symbol of a happy marriage. Do you think that this is the ideal to which God wants us to strive? For a happy family marital relationship. Notice this. This is one of my favorite statements in inspiration. Notice this. How much trouble and what a tide of woe and unhappiness would be saved if men and women also would continue to cultivate the regard, attention, and kind words of appreciation and little courtesies of life which kept love alive and which they felt were necessary in gaining the companions of their choice. So many times when we get married, Instead of continuing those loving attentions, they tend to dissipate as the years of the relationship go on. If the husband and wife would only continue to cultivate these attentions, which nourish love, they would be happy in each other's society and would have a sanctifying influence upon their families. They would have in themselves a little world of what? a little world of happiness and would not desire to go outside this world for new attractions and new objects of love. Do you know that if our young people were being raised in these homes, they would never be disgruntled with living at home. Children would want to stay at home as long as they possibly could. You know, because the ideology that when you become 18 that that's when you leave home, that is a new phenomenon. It used to be in the past that you never left home until you got married. But unfortunately, in this day and age, in this, in this mindset of independence, the home is greatly despised. Greatly despised. Notice this. This says a 48-hour sexual afterglow helps bond partners over time. Now, what is this referring to? This is talking specific, specifically about sexual intimacy amongst husband and wife. Unfortunately, because of all the devastation, many, very many married couples have no true intimacy between themselves. We're not going to go through all these details. It says sex plays a central role in reproduction, and it can be pleasurable, but scientific findings suggest that it may serve an additional purpose, bonding partners together. Now, was sexual intimacy between husband and wife only relegated to making children? No, it wasn't. Husband and wife were to use this as a mechanism to be drawn closer to each other and closer to God. You know, because it's amazing that when husband and wife come together in mutual love, that the angels of God are literally present to sanctify the bedroom. You know, I, I remember an experience. Uh, my wife used to work at a restaurant, and there were some young people that came into the restaurant, and I was actually preparing to do some meetings. And I was sitting adjacent to them, and I heard that they were talking about sexuality, and specifically, they were having a discussion as to whether or not polygamy was a legitimate alternative lifestyle. You know that there are a lot of our young people that are practicing this today. And so as I was listening to this conversation, I was saying, Lord, please do something to invite me into this conversation. I didn't want to be too abrupt, but I said, Lord, please open up the window. And so I, I kid you not, as soon as I prayed this prayer, 
one of the young women that were in the conversation looked, turned and looked directly at me, and she said, what do you think? <laughs> and so I went over to the table, and we started to discuss the principles of biblical sexuality. And it's sad because some of those young people were actually practicing lesbianism and homosexuality. And we were explaining to them from the Bible that unfortunately when you engage in these practices, that it literally invites demons into that space. And we talked about that by the grace of God, when husband and wife enter into these things, that the presence of God is literally present in that room. And it was just amazing to see the conviction take a hold of the minds of these young people. It says the restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the where? It begins in the home. The work of parents underlies every other society is composed of families and is what the heads of families make it. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon what? They depend upon home influences. Now in light of that, we're gonna turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis and we're going to go over some principles as it pertains to our subject matter for this evening called the marriage of Isaac. The marriage of Isaac. Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse 1. Now, what is this a picture of? What is this a picture of here on the screen? This is a symbol of a woman by the name of Rebecca, and this is a symbol of a man by the name of, it's not Abraham, his name is escaping my mind, but we'll get to it. Matt Eliezer is a very good uh, uh, Laban's brother, if I'm not mistaken. All right, Genesis chapter 24, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. They were making an oath. It says in verse 5, we're going to jump down. It says, And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abram, uh, Abraham said unto him, beware thou, that, beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying unto thy seed, I will give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So, in light of this, why was it so important, the uh, woman that Isaac married? Why was it so important, the woman that Isaac married? Why was it so important? Who was eventually going to come from the lineage of Isaac? Yes, Jesus. So do you think it was going to be very important, the woman that this man married? So should we just run around and just marry anyone when we are seeking to make a decision in regards to our life partner? No, we shouldn't. All right, this is Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, Abraham had become an old man and expected soon to die it says, Isaac was the one divinely appointed to succeed him as the keeper of the law of God and the father of the chosen people, but he was yet unmarried. In the mind of Abraham, the choice of a wife for his son was a matter of grave importance. He was anxious to have him marry one who would not lead him from God. All right, now does anybody know who this gentleman is? This is a man by the name of Harvey Newcomb. Harvey Newcomb. He wrote a series of books on, uh, on boy and girl development. Very powerful volumes. Notice what this man says. The first requisite in a companion for life is what? Now, when this is piety, what is this referring to? Spirituality, yes. I know not how a Christian can form so intimate a connection as this with one who is living in rebellion against God. And it is, it is amazing to me how many of us, even as seven-day Adventists, are marrying people that are in the world. 
And sadly, we're expecting God to bless our unions despite what is clearly written in the sacred text. It says, you profess to love Jesus above every other object and, for, and to forsake all that you may follow him. How then can you unite your interest with one who continually rejects and abuses the object of your soul's delight? Indeed, I am at a loss to understand how a union can be formed between the carnal and the renewed heart. It says, Abraham, the father of the faithful, and Isaac, the children of Israel, were also expressly forbidden to make marriages with the heathen. Now, what is this name right here? Now, did Solomon follow the divine direction and marry a godly woman? Now, were there very many beautiful and God-fearing women that, that were in Israel? There were very many. He had a large selection to choose from, but unfortunately, just like Samson, he didn't want to follow the dictates of the word of God. Now, who was Solomon's first wife? It was an Egyptian woman. Now, were the Egyptians following the teachings of, of, of God's word? Were, were they offering morning and evening sacrifice to Jehovah? No, they weren't. They were serving Satan. But it's amazing God in his mercy actually converted the wife of Solomon. But instead of learning from that experience, he kept practicing it again and again and again. And, it, and, and those women turned that man out so much that even Solomon, before his repentance, became a homosexual. Now this says, yet his strange wives turned away his heart and persuaded him to worship idols. Now what is this right here? What is this a picture of? Yes, this is a picture of different denominations. Well, somebody says, if I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, as long as they're a Christian, it doesn't matter what denomination that they are a part of. So I can marry someone who's a Roman Catholic. I can marry a Lutheran. If I'm a, if I'm a Presbyterian, I can marry a Pentecostal. It does not matter. Now, notice what Harvey Newcomb goes on to say. And it's amazing because Harvey Newcomb, this man, who lived in the 19th century, he was not a Seventh-day Adventist. But notice what the man says. I found this uh, very fascinating. It is a matter of great importance that the person with whom you form a connection for life should belong to the same denomination of Christians with yourself. Does the Bible say, come out from among them and be separate? Yes, it does. The separation of a family in their attendance upon public worship is productive of a great inconvenience and perplexity. And it is sad how many young people I talk to who are Seventh-day Adventists who are trying to convince themselves that marrying someone of another denomination is not a big deal. It's very, very sad. And, par and, and part of the reason for this is because Seventh-day Adventism has been so watered down Generally, there's not really seen any difference between a Seventh-day Adventist and a Baptist. Generally, the only difference is that we go to church on Saturday and they go to church on Sunday because essentially we're all just preaching the same thing. All right, this is Patriarchs and Prophets. Again, it says, in ancient times, marriage arrangements were generally made by the children, by the parents. Now, do you think that in today's age that children love for their parents to form their romantic relationships? Now, how old was Isaac when he got married? How old was Isaac when he got married? Isaac was 40 years old, according to Genesis 24. That man was 40 years old. He was a grown man, but he still yielded to the dictation of his parents. Do you think that he was trained to love a life of obedience? Yes, he was. And this was the custom among those who worship God. It says, but the bestowal of their affections, the youth, were guided by the judgment of their experienced God-fearing parents. But again, do we have very many God-fearing parents in this generation? No, we don't. And it is so sad how many young people we talk to who unfortunately do not have parents who can really guide them. The parents may be going to church, they may be singing in the choir, they may be deacons, but they're not really 
spiritual. Now, this is amazing. It says, why you should treat marriage more like a business. Now, why do you think that there is great incentive in treating marriage like a business? Because when you treat it like a business, you are less prone to enter into it based on emotions. Because should you be entering into marriage solely because of emotions? Now, should you love the person that you're entering into marriage with? But are your emotions, is that to be the prerequisite? No, it is not. All right, we're not going to go through all these details. It says, arranged marriages are, for, are, are far from a new concept. It says, for example, in India, it is speculated that as much as 60% of marriages are arranged. Now, now, is there a lot of divorce in India? No, there's not. And it's amazing that even in that heathen country, that because of the principles that they follow, that divorce is almost wholly unprevalent in that society. The method, process, and execution of arranged marriages around the world can, be, can vary quite dramatically. We're gonna jump down to the bottom. There's so much in this, I wish we had time to go through all of this. It says, both in traditional uh, arranged marriages and in the reality show version, the level of commitment exhibited by each partner is heightened from what we see in traditional marriages. Now notice what this person says. The biggest lesson I have learned from my experience as a matchmaker of arranged marriages on married and first sight and the extensive study and research into what makes arranged marriages work can be summed up in one, in one word and that word is what? Commitment. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. And one of the great reasons why so many homes are being broken and started incorrectly is because we don't understand the proper principles of commitment. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, many consider this the love chapter, one of, one of, the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest treaty that has ever been written on the proper principles of love and affection. We're going to start in verse 4. The Bible says, Charity suffereth a very short amount of time. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not what? It's not puffed up. Doth not behave itself what? It has decorum. It says, Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. It's mild manner. It thinketh no evil, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. We're going to jump down to verse uh, 13. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So if our homes are really going to be what God designs for them to be, that we need to understand true principles of biblical commitment and love. All right, now does anybody know what this is? What is this a symbol of? What is this a symbol of? Yes, this is when Jacob, when he went to go steal the birthright from Esau. Now did God arrange the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah? Did God arrange the marriage of Adam and Eve? But did even conflict come into those marriages? Yes, they did. One of the things that the Bible teaches us again and again and again is the fact that things happen in life, even in situations that God himself has ordained. Now, let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Genesis. As we are winding down and bringing this message to a close, let's turn to Genesis chapter 27. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 27. Are we learning anything this evening? Amen. Genesis chapter 27, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here I am, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take some venison. Now, does anybody know what venison is? 
it's rendered deer, but in many cases it was just game that was, that was found uh, when persons went hunting. It says, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and that my soul may bless thee before I die. It says, and Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, and uh, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now, before we continue to read, why do you think that the Bible referenced the fact twice that Isaac wanted savory meat, that he wanted venison? Why do you think the Bible was highlighting this point? We're going to get to it. Let's continue to read. It says, Now therefore, verse 8, My son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. This is the third time. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man. We're going to jump down to verse 12. It says, My father peradventure will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Verse 13. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. This is the fourth time. Verse 15. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of his eldest son Esau, which were uh, with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob. 16. And she put skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. 17. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son. Verse 18. And he came to the father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. 19. And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau thy firstborn. I have done according to thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit, eat of my venison, that thou... Uh, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? Notice this point. Notice this point. So the Bible was constantly repeating this fact that Isaac loved this venison. Now, do you think that Isaac had a problem with his appetite? Yes, he did. Now, when you are struggling with appetite, is it going to influence your decision making? Is it going to especially affect your spiritual decision making? Because in principle, was Isaac supposed to be bestowing the birthright upon Esau? No, he was not. And because of his persistency in wanting to do that, this is actually what influenced Rebecca to deceive her husband. Notice this ever subject to mere outward and earthly attractions, Esau took two wives of the daughters of Heth. Esau had violated one of the conditions of the covenant, notice, yet Isaac was still unshaken in his determination to bestow upon him the birthright. So previously in Isaac's life, he was always ready to give obedience, but in this situation, he was not ready to give obedience. Let's notice why. Now, does anybody know who these two gentlemen were? Man by the name, two men by the name of Russell and Colin Standers. They started an institution by the name of Heartland Institute. This says marriage is an eternal triangle, not the eternal triangle of the classical novel, but an eternal triangle involving God, a husband, and a wife. If both husband and wife are linked to Christ by indestructible bonds of love, then the marriage is invincible. God is saying that if you follow my principles, your marriage will be invincible. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. It says, if, on the other hand, one partner allows the relationship with God to falter, then there is always the possibility of marital strife, or both partners, disharmony and even failure. This possibility does not mean that the lack of harmony will always result. And it goes on. 
It says, of course, not every committed Christian can make a suitable partner for another Christian. Such a marriage will never be defiled by cruelty, harshness, coerceness, indifference, or sensual or blasphemous talk. All right, and, and it says, the wife and family should never be neglected for other responsibilities. It's talking about the husband. He will preserve the individuality of the wife as the two lives blend together in a, in a unified direction. So again, do you think that Isaac, as he progressed in his life, was always faithful in a, in, in a direct sense to his marriage vow as a husband? No, he wasn't. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, that he was going out and committing adultery, but unfortunately, Isaac faltered in his spiritual leadership. Does that make sense? Does anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of the venison that Isaac was addicted to. Now, again, what does the Bible bring out in the beginning of Genesis chapter 27? What physical deformity did Isaac have? He was blind. Now, in light of that, do you think that there is any connection between the eating of venison or meat and blindness? Notice this. Now, this is taken from the telegraph. Now, is the telegraph a religious outlet? Does the telegraph preach medical missionary work? No, it doesn't. But notice what they say. Too much red meat could lead to blindness, claim scientists. These are not Christian scientists. Researchers have shown that those who consume 10 portions or more a week of, of this are nearly 50% more likely to experience deterioration of the retina in old age. Is this exactly what Isaac was experiencing? And sadly, this condition of things came about because he was a slave to his appetite. Now, in that condition, could Isaac possibly think rationally? No, he couldn't. We're going to skip past this for the sake of time. This says, boy goes blind from eating only meat, potatoes, and Cheerios. Taken from the New York Post. Amazing facts. Now, what is this right here? Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of something called endurance. This is a symbol of something called endurance. Let's turn in our Bibles as we close to Galatians chapter 6. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to read in verse 9. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, one of the things that we desperately need if our uh, marriages, if our families are going to be successful, if we are going to make it through the vicissitudes of life, we need to learn and to understand the principles of endurance. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, notice what the Bible says. Actually, we'll start in verse 8 just to get some context. It says, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh, flesh reap what? Corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint what? So God is promising that if we endure by his grace, that we will, that we will reap the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Now, notice what this says in the book, Ministry of Healing. Now, this is talking about when a husband and wife initially get married, and as they are matriculating through their marriage experience. As life with its burden of perplexity and care meets the newly wedded pair, the romance with which imagination so often invests marriage, what, what happens to it? It disappears. Now, is this saying that once it disappears that you can never have romance again in the relationship? One of the things that God seeks to reemphasize, especially when it comes to marriage, is that marriage, it takes work. It takes work in order to make proper love. And when I say make love, I'm not talking about from a sensual standpoint. I'm talking about the principle of love. Husband and wife learn each other's character as it was impossible to learn it in their previous association. This is a most critical period in their experience. The happiness and usefulness of their whole future life 
depend upon their taking a right course now. Often, they discern in each other unsuspected weaknesses and defects. Now, what is that word? Now, do you think that this means every day or maybe uh, bi-monthly? Every day, you're going to find out defects about the character of your spouse. But notice the counsel that God gives in light of this. But the hearts that love has united will discern excellencies also heretofore unknown. Let all seek to discover the excellencies rather than the defects. This is the mindset of love. Because again, our, do we have a lot of sin in us as human beings? But when we give our life to Christ, it, it, is God constantly focusing on our defects of character? No, he isn't. Now, don't get me wrong. God is calling us to be holy, even as he is holy. But is God always beating us up because of our failures and our disappointments? No, he's not. It says, often it is our own attitude, the atmosphere that surrounds ourselves, which determines what will be revealed to us in another. There are many. Now, when this says many, what percentage do you think that this is referring to? I can promise you it's probably about 90%. Notice what it goes on to say. There are many who regard the expression of love as a weakness. And sadly, very many of us have grown up in homes in which we never learned how to properly express love and affection, especially us as men. And you know, the spirit of prophecy literally says that there are women who have died because they did not receive affection from their husbands. That's serious. This says, this, this spirit checks the current of sympathy. As the social and generous impulses are repressed, they wither and the heart becomes desolate and cold. We should beware of this error. Love cannot long exist without what? And it's so healthy for children to see husband and wife being affectionate towards each other. The husband coming into the kitchen as the wife is cooking and kissing her and holding her, it's such a beautiful thing for the children to experience this. Let not the heart of one connected with you starve for the want of kindness and sympathy. It says, though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment. Satan will tempt you to put this, to put this in your mind, expel it as it were a venomous serpent. Do not harbor over the thought. Determine to be all that it is possible to be to each other. Continue the early attentions. It's very important for a husband and wife to flirt with each other. It says, study to advance the happiness of each other. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance. Then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be as it were the very beginning of love. Notice, the warmth of true friendship. The love that binds heart to heart is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. Is this beautiful? This is what God designs to have manifested in our home. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter what our homes have been in the past. God is promising us that if we covenant to be in a proper relationship with him, if we ask for his grace and strength to practice these principles, even if our homes have been like hell on earth, God can still turn them into heaven. We're told in the, in, in the spirit of prophecy that all the common waters of life that Jesus can turn into the wine of heaven. And in light of that, if that is your desire, I invite you to raise your hand wherever you are. If you want your home to be like heaven on earth, it doesn't matter if you are a child, if you're a husband, if you're a father, it doesn't matter how broken that home may be. You can say that it doesn't matter what anyone else may be doing in my home. I'm going to determine to follow the Lord so that the heavenly angels can abide in my sanctuary. And in light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for what you have communicated this evening. 
Lord, I know that very many of us have, have experienced pain and heartache in our home, dear Lord, but I just pray that you would give us forgiveness for those who may have hurt us. I pray that you would, that you would forgive us for those we may have hurt. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would uh, turn around our situations. I pray that you be with maybe some of our children, dear Lord, who have uh, gone away, turned away even from the Lord because of the toxicity that they have experienced in the home. I pray that in a special way that you be with those who are husband and wife, that you would help us to have heaven on earth. Lord, and I just pray that you would help us to stay on our knees so that Satan will not gain domination over us. And Lord, I pray that you would be especially with the world. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us as believers to, to, to try to stem the tide of wickedness that is so prevalent in the world today. And the greatest way that we can do that is by being faithful in our homes. And so, dear Father, I just pray that you would keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.